Go with me to Colossians chapter 3 now. That's where we are going to sit down and study this afternoon. Colossians chapter 3. Let's go there and see what does that mean now. What does it mean? Because we ought to be changed by something. Right? We ought to be changed by something. And unless we receive that knowledge, we will not be changed. And we must be changed. Oh, friends. We must. Verse number nine. It says, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. And have put on one. The new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Who is our creator? It's God. God is our creator. Jesus is our creator. John 1, right? By him, everything was made. He's the word. Everything was made by him, right? So if Jesus is our creator, right? So we need to be transformed after the image of Jesus. How? In verse 10 now, there is a key. We need something so we can be changed, right? We need something. Look at that verse 10 again. And have put on what? The new man. How is the new man renewed? Which is renewed in knowledge. Oh, friends. In knowledge. After the image of him that created him. In other words, we need to know something in order for us to be changed. We need to receive a knowledge in order for us to be changed. And we need to know what is that knowledge. Because unless we receive that knowledge, there is no change within us, friends. No change. We need to know what is that knowledge. What is the knowledge that we need? Because we are going over a series, which is what? Which is the plane of salvation. And the knowledge, so, is not anything else than the knowledge of salvation. See, everything... Is around, is around the salvation. The knowledge that we need uh, is around salvation, is the knowledge of salvation. Once we get the knowledge of salvation, we will receive, we will see our need to change. And the Bible confirms that. Go with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, who was about to be born in Luke chapter 1? You know the story. Who was about to be born in Luke chapter 1? Talk to me. G yes, Jesus. Yes. Who else? Who else? John also. John was about to be born. And in, in John, in, in verse 76, verse 77, Jesus was, even God, was establishing the mission of John the Baptist. Verse 76, part of his mission was what? Verse 76, and the child shall be called what? The prophet of the highest. For thus shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Was he preparing the way of the first coming of Jesus? Right? Oh. Verse 77, to give what kind of knowledge? To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by what? By the remission of their sins. Oh, we understand now. We cannot be saved in our sins. Because once we receive the knowledge of salvation, what do we see? What need do we see? The need of the remission of our sins, friends. Because we are saved from our sins. Now, John the Baptist came in whose spirit again? Elijah. The spirit of Elijah. Right? Matthew chapter 11. And we are told in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4, all the way down to verse 6, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, who will be sent again? Elijah again. And the great and dreadful day of the Lord, that's the second coming, friends. So that means before the second coming of Jesus, people who are to preach God's salvation, people who are to announce, even prepare themselves and prepare others for the second coming of Jesus, what kind of message, what kind of knowledge this will be giving also? The knowledge of what? The knowledge of salvation, my friends. And that knowledge, we are told, right, it is a knowledge that is unto the people by the remission of their sins. So, when we receive the knowledge of salvation, what is our duty now? Because you know that you are in need of salvation, 
Now, the knowledge of salvation will allow you to see your condition. So what should be your next step now? What is your next step? Yes, I hear it, right? Confess your sins. Every sin. Yes, I like that. Every sin. Every sin. That's 1 John 1, verse 9, right? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. That says what? Right? If we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and what? And just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of, of what? Of all unrighteousness. No. No. Don't go there yet. I'm going to go to 1 John. Now, let's, let's stay in Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Verse 76, we are told, John, he shall, he's a child, right? And he shall be called the prophet of the highest. And this is not the first time those words were repeated about John. Because he was to have a lifestyle in order to be the prophet of the highest. He had to have a lifestyle. And what was that lifestyle we are told? Go with me to verse 15, same chapter. Verse 15, look at that, verse 15. It says, uh, verse 15, For he shall be great and in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink what? Drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be what? He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So wine, not only literally, but also spiritually, my friends. So if we remain drinking the wine of Babylon, are we going to be changed? Are we, are we showing that we are receiving the knowledge of salvation? Are we being saved, my friends? No, we are not being saved. So that was the preparation of John from his mother's womb. For his mother's womb. Then afterward, when he was born, he had to continue on that experience. What does that say about us mothers nowadays? Or soon to be mothers nowadays? Oh, is from conception, there's a preparation. From conception, my friends. And when the child is born, we ought to continue on the experience that we have started. That's it, friends. Now, we said that, we receive the knowledge of salvation, which is what? Unto the people by the remission of our sins, which means uh, when we receive the knowledge, we see our condition. Our condition to be saved from our sins. Now, once we see our condition, based on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, what do we do? We need to confess our sins now. Why? Because God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to, clean, to cleanse us of what? Of all unrighteousness. In other words, when we receive the knowledge, what do we realize when we, when we see the knowledge? We realize our unrighteousness. And we compare our unrighteousness not with someone else's unrighteousness, or not, not with someone else's personal spiritual experience. No, with the righteousness of Jesus. So once we see the righteousness of, Je the righteousness of Jesus, what need do we see? The need to become righteous as Jesus is righteous. And he is just faithful and just enough to do just that. To make us become righteous. Is he righteous? Oh, you better believe it. By the way, the next chapter, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John 2, verse number 1, we are told that Jesus, oh, the apostle John, he's speaking. The apostle John, he's speaking. He says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you see not. But if it's a condition, accidentally, if you sin, you have what? You have an advocate with the father. Who is he? Jesus, the righteous. I wonder why he said the righteous. Because there is no one righteous. No, not one. Oh, that's why I said Paul. Because these are the words of Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. None is righteous. But we should see our need to be, to receive the righteousness of Jesus. 
Then now, we will confess our sins and he will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, my friends. Now, because, but there is a step. It doesn't stop right there. But in order for us to wish the righteousness, he has to reveal his righteousness unto us. He has to reveal, Jesus has to reveal his righteousness unto us. So how does Jesus reveal his righteousness unto us? Huh? How does Jesus reveal his righteousness unto us? Yes, uh, I could go there, but that's not where I'm going. Somebody said to his law, which it, this is a good answer. Um, I want to go somewhere else, right? How does Jesus reveal his righteousness unto us now? Because, because we are told in Romans chapter 10 how they can be converted unless they hear something. Unless they hear what? We're just going to go somewhere and push the law of God to someone? Oh, you're going to be in trouble. Oh, friends. So, so how, how does God reveal his... You see why I'm heading there? You see why I'm heading there now? How does Jesus reveal his righteousness unto us? No. It is through the gospel, my friends. Through the gospel. Go there, Romans chapter 1, friends. Romans chapter 1. Jesus revealed his righteousness unto us through the gospel. So we can be transformed by the knowledge, the knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of salvation, right? And that salvation is revealed through the gospel that we may be changed. Simple, friends. Simple. The gospel, friends. It's that rocket science, friends. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. What, what, what it Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Unto salvation through everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, now here it is. For therein, in the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. What? The just shall live by faith. My friend, that's it. So the, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel because we are to preach some, something to the people in order for them to be saved. Romans chapter 10, you can read that. Romans chapter 10, that says, how are they going to, that's verse number 14. Let's read this, I love it. Verse number, Romans 14, verse, Romans 10 rather, verse 14, look at that. Let's start in verse 13 rather for context. You know, we were having devotion and I was sharing something with my family and uh, I was, uh, and I said, you know, let's, let's read this scripture for context. And my wife said, you love context. I said, yeah, I love context. Mm -hmm. Yes, it gives you a better understanding. Verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation, right? Verse 14, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Verse 15 now. Verse, verse 14 seals, still, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear him without a preacher? But what is the preacher preaching? What is the preacher preaching? Is the gospel, my friends. That's why we are told in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, with the first angel's message, right? What are we told? Call it with me. Call Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw what? And I saw another angel, right? Flying what? In the midst of heaven. Having what? The everlasting gospel. What is he doing with it? To preach unto them that dwell on the earth. To every nation, every kindred, tongue, and people. The gospel is to be preached. Is the gospel that needs to be preached unto the people so they can see their need and be changed into the image of Jesus. Now, the gospel is being preached. The gospel has been preaching unto the people. But will everyone be saved? Will everyone change into the image of Jesus? Oh, friends, I wonder why. I wonder why. We are told in the Bible, some people obey not the gospel. They hear the gospel, but they obey not the gospel. And as a result, we are told, the wrath of God, God's vengeance is reserved unto them. 
God's vengeance. Because they obey not the gospel, friends. So as you're hearing the gospel, the gospel of Jesus, do you see your need to be changed, my friends? Because unless we change, God's vengeance will be upon us. I was I'm tempted to go somewhere. But God's vengeance, friends, and let's go in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's confirm that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's confirm that. Those that obey not the gospel, I have to read this. Those that obey not the gospel, they will receive what? The vengeance of Jesus, the vengeance of God. Let's start in verse number, verse number 7, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. Will, will he reveal himself? Shall be revealed from heaven with what? With his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking what? Taking, are you there with me? Taking vengeance, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Second Solomon chapter 1, verse 8. Verse 8. That know not God, in that obey not what? Obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will happen unto them? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, friends. Because some people obey not the gospel. They hear the message. Oh, they come to church. Every Sabbath they come to church. Or they go to other churches. But yet they hear the gospel. They see the need to change. They see plainly what God's truth is revealed. Is revealing. But yet... They choose, they choose not to change. They choose not to change. And the voice of the Holy Spirit is being silenced slowly in the heart. And they're heading straight to perdition. Oh, let it not be you, friend. Oh, let it not be me. As you are hearing the gospel being preached unto us, the knowledge of salvation by the remission of sin, friend. This is what we need in order to be changed, my friends. And those people who obey not the gospel, also, they receive the wrath of God. God's vengeance, his wrath also upon them. Because what? They choose not to follow the gospel's principle. Look, let's go to Romans chapter 1 and see that. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, people who refuse to obey, to obey the gospel, despite God revealing his gospel unto them, what will happen unto them? They will face the wrath of God. We saw this, but I'm, I'm going somewhere. That's why I'm going back there. Romans chapter 1, verse number 7, verse number 16, which is the gospel, right? We read this before. Now, verse 18, now look at that. Remember, the righteousness of God is revealed, is revealed in the gospel, is revealed. Now, verse 18 now, it says some people, even though the gospel is revealed unto them, but they choose to remain in unrighteousness. What will happen unto them? The wrath of God, friends. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold what? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means they hear the truth. Even profess the truth. Yet they are not transformed by the truth. They are not transformed by the truth. And those people, they will face the wrath of God. Oh, friends, like I said, let it not be me. Let it not be you. How often you come to church, even to save, to serve, you hear the gospel, you hear the call to surrender unto God. How often? And you have been resisting the voice of the Holy Spirit to simply surrender. That's all God wants from you. Just surrender. And he will do the rest. Just surrender. If you think you are too filthy, guess what? One day, if you don't surrender now, God will say, filthy, filthy, steal. 
But, oh, 1 John 1 verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from what? All, I don't care how much you have. All unrighteousness. He is willing to do that just for you. Just for me. God is willing to do that. Now, those people who, are, who we are told in the Bible that are waiting for the wrath of God. Why? Because they hold the truth. The truth in unrighteousness. They profess the truth, yet they are not transformed by the truth. Now, those people, we are told that they are inexcusable. No excuse. No excuse for those who know the truth and yet are not practicing the truth because only the truth can set you free. John chapter 8. Now, those people, we are told, not only they will hold on to their own righteousness, but they will go deeper in their own righteousness. Look at that now. Look at that. Verse number 21. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified neither heart, not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. In their foolish heart was what? Was darkened. Verse 23, and change the glory or the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And what they are ending up doing now, they say, verse 25, who changed the truth. They were holding the truth. Now they changed the truth. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore, forever. So they're ending up worshipping the creature. And friends, this is happening literally now. I'm telling you. Watch, friends. It's happening literally. Look at, look, look, look at the screen. Progressive seminary student, seminary, seminary students, offered a confession to plants. How do we think about sins against nature? Friends. They, they are seminarians now. So seminarians confessing their sins. This, right? Confessing their sins to nature. It's happening. So which, who's, who they are following? Who they are following, friends? Oh, friends. And so we see those people, this is all they are doing. No, now, since they are following somebody, Right, right now, I, I put this on your screen because right now there is something that is happening right now. The, the Amazon Synod that is to be started this week. It's starting this week. Right? Yes, tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's starting tomorrow. Yeah, next week. I agree with that. Yes, I agree. Right? It's starting tomorrow. The Amazon Synod. The, and the Amazon Synod is for what? Right? It's for what, they say? They said, well... It's because we want um, to study the possibility to ordain married men as priests because of a lack of people in the remote areas, such as the Amazon. So they call Amazon sign up. Oh, let's confirm it. Look at that. When the curtain rises on Sunday from the October 6th to 27th, synod of bishops on the Amazon, much of the attention will be focused on what? on the possibility of ordaining married men to the priesthood. This is what they are studying, which is not our concern, right? But let's, let's continue. And it says, the synod of, of the Amazon is to address the spiritual need of the indigenous peoples in a region where poverty is rampant. And long distances between sparse communities make the church's ministry complicated. But also to address what? Also to address what? The ecological crisis in a region where deforestation and extractive industries threaten the environment. Yes. This is what's happening. So, friends. So, they are trying to address what? An ecological crisis. 
And what are the words are they using now for ecological crisis? Come on, the common one. Climate change. Climate change. That's it. Climate change. This is what they're using. This is what they're using. And what is pop sol the pop solution for climate change? From La Dato Si, here it is. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath. This is Sunday, right? To heal our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with what? And with the world. That's his, his solution. Now, this is what they're trying to do. Now, what I'm going to share with you next is going to make you see that we are really in the end. Now I'm wondering, and now I understand why Pope Francis said his papacy is to be a short one. And what I'm going to share with you is they are about to ordain or to, to make someone become cardinal. Yes, it happened yesterday. And they asked him, what do you think about Pope Francis? And he said, Pope Francis is Vatican II. That's it. Mercy. But do you know what Vatican II is? Let's, all oh friends, let's look at that. Look at that. We also saw that. A Jesuit cardinal designate says Pope Francis is making Vatican II real. That's what he said. Who is he? And it's, it's a prominent man. He's about to be a cardinal. What does that mean he's about to be a cardinal? Right? What does that mean? Let's, let, let's pass that. What does that mean? He says that. To be a cardinal, right, this man, that means he will give him, that will give him the right to vote in the conclave to elect the Pope's successor. That's it. So is he going to have clout? Yes, friends. And what is he following? Laudato Si also is following. Now what is Vatican II? I passed it, but let me go back. What is Vatican II? We need to know what is says Second Vatican II Council, also called Vatican II. That's from Encyclopedia Britannica. It says it's the 21st Ecumenical Council of the Roman Catholic Church announced by Pope John Paul XXIII on January 25, 1959 as a means of spiritual renewal for the church and as an occasion for Christians Separated from Rome to do what? To join in a search for Christian unity. This is Vatican II ecumenism. No wonder why the Pope, this Pope is traveling so much. That's the agenda, friends. And it says, look, and look, look at how they are obvious, they clear about their intention. Yet the people, they just go in it. It says, preparatory commissions appointed by the Pope prepared an agenda and produced draft, or what? What word is that? Of decrees on various topics. They have decrees. In the Bible, when we have decrees being, when we have decrees going out, what is that? It's something that must be done. Decrees. And they have strong words to qualify what they're trying to do. It says, those summoned to the council included all Catholic bishops and certain other church dignitaries invited to the council sessions, but without what? Without right to vote now. You have no right to make a decision. Where a number of observers from the major Christian churches and communities separated from Rome and a number of Catholics called auditors. You just here to listen and follow. Just an auditor. That's why this try. Decree. The decree is going forth. Be, friends, this is Revelation 13 being fulfilled. That's it, friends. It's being fulfilled. And it says, the council also promulgated what? Decrees again on the pastoral duties of bishops. Ecumenism. To Eastern Rite churches, the ministry and life of priests, what also? The education for the priesthood, the religious life, the missionary activity of the church, the apostolate of the laity, and the media. The media? The media of social communication. Is he also meeting with 
with, with the CEO of what? Apple, of Microsoft, of all of them, friends. Facebook, all of them. Friends, all this was, friends, to control the media, it was since the Vatican II. The establishment, the establishment of that. It was just for that. Now it's being fulfilled, friends. Are we close to the end? Are we not close to the end, friends? Oh, friends. So that's why we, we ought to see our need now to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And that's why I say, this, they know what they're doing. And they ask him now. Is what we, when they ask him, they ask him, what do you think about Pope Francis now? He's the answer now. He says, his answer he was immediate. Immediate answer. The shortest answer is that the Pope's commitment to what? To Vatican II. That's it. The Pope's commitment to Vatican II. This is what he's doing. And friends, time is fulfilling. Time is fulfilling, friends. Time is fulfilling. So what should be our duty, my friends? Our duty is to do what? To be transformed into the image of Jesus. Now, what should we do to be transformed into the image of Jesus, friends? What should we do? We saw that. What is the formula in the Bible in order to, be, to reflect the image of God? Huh? Huh? What should we do in order to reflect the image of God? Give me one scripture. That's one that is potent. Something that we should be doing in order to reflect the image of God. And the instruction is clear in that scripture. The glory of God, to be changed into his glory. What should we do? What should we do? We are to behold him. And the last time we spoke, we saw whose account that be, who beheld God and was transformed into his glory. Hmm? Whose account? That was in Exodus 33, right? Exodus 33, Exodus 34, right? He asked God to reveal his glory unto him. Um, now, here's my question. Was that the first time that Moses beheld God's glory? Friends. Was it the first time that Moses beheld God's glory? Was it the first time? The oh, friends, at the burning bush. You see how we see that to behold God's glory is an experience? And it's a continual experience? Moses started beholding God's glory at the burning bush. What did he see now? What did he see? Let's, let's go to that scripture. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Moses, Exodus, Exodus, right? Moses was beholding God's glory. And he beheld God's glory where? At the burning bush. At the burning bush. Chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Moses beheld God's glory at the burning bush. I wonder, how did he behold God's glory? How do we see that he beheld God's glory at the burning bush? Because when he beheld God's glory on the mountain, that was not his first time. Now I understand why he asked God again, why he asked God to show me your glory. Because he knew something about God's glory. What did he see now? Exodus chapter 3 now, chapter 3, verse number, verse number 1. Where was he? He was in the... He, he was in the desert, right? In the desert, what, what, the desert of Midian, right? Oh, desert, we could, we could go deep with that. Where was he, though? Know? Right? All right, where? Mountain of Horeb. Oh, I like that. You, you see the experience? So that means he found himself in that first place, then he asked for the same experience. Same place, same experience. Verse number, verse number two now. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in what? In a flame of fire out of the means of a bush. In, last phrase now, last phrase. The bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. So I, I want, so what in the scripture show us that Moses was beholding God's glory? What is the bush? Okay, someone said the bush was not burning. What in the scripture shows us that Moses was beholding God's glory? Moses was just beholding a burning bush. Do you mean that if I'm burning some wood right here, that means I'm beholding God's glory? 
Okay, the bush was not burning. Okay, all right. But Moses understood something, a principle in the Bible. You know what? Because, because God's glory is like a consuming fire. God's glory is like a consuming fire. Write down. I won't have time to read that scripture with you. Write down Deuteron, Exodus chapter Exodus chapter 24, verse 16, verse 17. Exodus 24, verse 16, verse 17. God's glory is like a consuming fire. It's like a fire. But the bush was not burning, we are told. He was not burning. Now, now what, was, what was the work of Moses as he beheld God's glory? God was sending him for, him for a mission. What was his mission? To go and deliver the people out of where? From Egypt, out of Egypt. Get them out of Egypt. So, what is like unto Egypt today that we need to go and get people out of? Babylon, friends. Egypt like a, like a, like a dragon. Egypt. Dragon, Babylon also, the dragon gave him his power, his seed, and great authority. In Revelation 18, verse 4, we need to call people out of Babylon. So what experience should we have, should we be having like unto Moses also? Beholding God's glory. Because how can we call people into transformation if we ourselves, we are not transformed? How can we call them, friends? Moses was beholding the burning bush, and he was beholding God's glory. He was beholding Jesus. He was beholding God. And we are told that that angel who appealed unto Moses, it was Jesus. Jesus appealed unto Moses. Write down Acts chapter 7, verse 30, verse 31, and verse all the way down to verse 38. Verse 31 to verse 38. Acts chapter 7, verse 30 to verse 38. That angel was Jesus who appealed unto Moses. That Stephen, Stephen was recounting the account. And then he confirmed that was Jesus. Now, when Moses had that work to do, right, the work to call the people out of, out of Egypt, now, did God, what was the work of God for him? The work of God was to prepare him for the mission he had for him. The work of God. Now, did God do something with Moses? Oh, the question is, was Moses changed now when he beheld God's glory? That first time he beheld God's glory, was he changed, friends? Was Moses changed? Was he changed? Oh, you got to believe it. Chapter 4 now shows us he was changed how do we know he was changed? Did Moses have power before that to make the rod become a serpent? Did he have that power? No, he didn't have that power. God invested him with that power. Then God told him also in verse number 7 of Exodus chapter 4, he told, me, he told him, put your hand in that, in, in, in that bosom. And what happened to his hand? It became leprous. Then he saw that, put him again. What happened to, to the hand again? God delivered. This is the leprosy of sin. Moses was changed, my friends. Because the same way he had to call the people out of Egypt, the house of bondage, bondage unto sin, God had to deliver Moses from the bondage of sin first before he does the work. So before we go and call the people out of Babylon, what, what, should, we, what should be our need? Deliverance, deliverance from sin also. Why do we need that? Because we need to be able to give the people a testimony of how God delivered you. Amen. Once you have a testimony, then the people can relate to you and see that it is possible to change. Because you don't just give them a gospel according to John, gospel according to Mark. What about gospel according to yourself? I'm not talking about your own gospel. The work of the gospel in you now. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. The work of the gospel in you. And all of us, we need to be changed in order for us to do that work. And we all have a work to do. We all are called to minister. We all are called to do God's work. But all of us, we are in need of the change, my friends. 
So Moses was changed, right? And God gave him how many signs? How many signs God gave Moses? Huh? He gave him three signs. The first one, verse number two, the first one was using the rod. Throw it down, right? Became what? A serpent, right? Get him by the, by the tail. Became what? The rod again, right? The second sign, verse number seven, right? Is the leprous hand. What about the third sign? The third sign, he said, you're going to make water become what? Blood. And it says, that sign, if they don't listen to the first two, that one they're going to believe in. And those three signs, God was showing me that he pointed to the three angels' message. It's really the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. And we are to preach the everlasting gospel wherever we go. And also, those three, those three signs, it points to the, to the opportunities that God has given us. Some of us, we have more than three opportunities. Numerous, innumerous opportunities. Yet, God still wants to save you, giving you the knowledge, my friends. He wants to save you. Moses, God was using. He was using him, but he had a preparation for him. The preparation was that he had to behold God first to be transformed. Through what? The bush, the burning bush. Now, Oh, friends, now you see now, he found himself well again, in Horeb again, and he asked, I want to see your glory. He remembered that experience. No wonder why he asked that experience. Oh, what came to my mind is, is um, the account of the woman at the well. He says, if I give you the water, you're going to ask me. You're just going to ask me until you feel. So Moses was not tired of God's glory. And we ought to, we are not to be tired of the experience with God also. Beholding God, my friends. Beholding God. And this is the experience God wants us to have. Wants us to. So, friends, do you want to be changed into God's glory? Because if we are not changed, by the way, no salvation for us. But guess what? Salvation is available unto all of us. Since salvation is available unto all of us, it's just our duty to accept salvation. Because the day of salvation is just nearer than we believe. The signs are all around us. And the day is just nearer, 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 my friends. So what should be our duty? Accept the gospel. Believe the gospel. And be saved, my friends. Simple. So who today see their need to surrender to the gospel, friends? The gospel. Who today see their need to surrender to the gospel? All of us. Now, when we receive the gospel, in order to be changed, to become a new creature in Jesus Christ, we are told that we do that through baptism. That's Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. When you are baptized, the old man dies, and we, be, we come to the newness of life. So who see their need to have Bible study and to be baptized? Who do they see their need? We have Bible study class going on. Who see their need for Bible study and be baptized? Because God's salvation is still available, but it will not be available forever. Who see their need, my friends? Who see their need? All right, all right. The table was set, and the book was open. But the year of salvation, and we have preached the acceptable year of salvation, the acceptable year of the gospel. So friends, my prayer is that all of us, that we see the need to accept the gospel. We see the need to be transformed into God's image, without which we cannot see God. We cannot see God, friends.